and outrageous nowadays is uh, for people to organize exhibit artists to um, do their work and pay to put it somewhere in a gallery or museum or um, to expose it for an um, exhibition. I mean, this is unbelievable. It's outrageous. And how do we deal with this thing? I mean, I, my question is for everybody who can answer. And how we deal with this thing of its um, of this system of uh, capitalism? I mean, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> the question. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So your question mainly the, the first part, then is about artists actually paying to have exhibitions, yes? Yes. Okay. yes. Any reactions? We sympathize with your <laughs> with your feelings. <laughs> I mean it's also in the for example, New Museum in, in New York City. You know, there was a point where they had, you probably know the collector, one of the board members uh, is, a, is a famous Greek collector, and, and it was his collection that was shown at the museum. You know, it's unbelievable. What, you know, that's just so unethical, right? Uh, this stuff goes on, though. I mean, you know, we're talking about the, the, the most unregulated uh, economy that exists, probably, in the art world, even before the crash. I mean, it could be the model for what you know neoliberalism is trying to do to capitalism is the art world. It's so unregulated in most parts of the world. So, but yeah, it's very, very frustrating. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Greg talked about the work they've been doing in New York around the Guggenheim Museum, and in London, we've had a campaign now that's been running for four years with a group called Liberate Tape. It's again, you can go online. Some great videos that I really recommend you have a look at. And that's about, so you were talking about the fact that does the name get taken over? Well, it does already. I mean, in Britain, BP and all the mail of nature and Shell, the oil companies, sponsor all of the museums. And so it is the BP portrait award or you know, whatever. Um, and so Liberate Tate, uh, which came out of a, a workshop that the, the Tate asked an artist to do about disobedience. And when the workshop happened in the Tate, what they wanted to do was criticize the corporate sponsorship of the Tate. Uh, that artist was taken up to the top of the tape to the management room and told in kind of no uncertain terms that criticizing BP would not be acceptable as a part of the disobedience of the workshop. <laughs> so of course the artists involved in that workshop did criticize BP and that's come out of this and there's been some amazing actions and we've done, it's a combination of direct actions in the museum using the turbine hall and the tape modern which is a public space. Um, so it's sort of trying to play with the fact it's a public space. We're playing because everything is a piece of art, not a protest, because obviously if you call something a piece of art, you can get away with things that you can't, it's a protest. But, you know, playing with that kind of, that liminal space within those things. And we're also kind of having a lobbying campaign with the trustees, because we don't think the BP actually gives the take that much money. But of course they get the cultural kudos for sponsoring the thing. So one example of an action we've done is to bring a 16 metre long wind turbine off a wind, off a, a wind windmill. Uh, from Wales, we cut it into three bits, we brought it into the state turbine hall, unannounced, obviously without their permission, and we have reassembled it in the turbine hall and left it, and it was called the gift, because in Britain, as a member of public, you can gift a piece of work to a museum, and the important point about that is, the museum then has to have a debate about whether it takes it into its collection, so we forced the debate to happen. Now, to connect that to what you're saying about how do we overcome capitalism and all these things, uh, I would say that, that that attempt to reassert the public against the corporate influence, even in those kind of actions, those minimal actions, well not minimal, but you know, very specific art world kind of related actions, is part of a broader strategy that we've all got to do, isn't it? You know, we've all got to find a way to connect, and, and I think the internet and these things do create this possibility of this in a way that wasn't possible in the early part of the 20th century when other revolution movements were trying to do this across Europe. We have got, as a public in Europe, a kind of in the sense of the people, uh, in the sense of our immediate uh, neighbours, in the sense of the people we have most in common with, we have got to kind of reassert the public in some way, and it's it's going to be a difficult thing, you know, like it always is, because you know we we brought up to believe we, we should be the ones in power, aren't we? You know, and that's that's the kind of fundamental problem I think. But that also comes back to what I was saying about the relationship between creativity and social movements and the um, the capacity for imagination. You know, I do I'm not I'm not patronising people. Obviously, we all have got imaginations. But when crisis happens, people don't naturally think, oh, let's have a commune. You know, you have to kind of have some ideas of what to do. And that requires an, an imaginative leap. 
you know? And I think that's what art and design or creativity brings to the movements. And that's an unwritten book. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but that, to me, that combination of the kind of a militancy, a direct action, and trying to rebuild a public and a kind of real democracy is the answer. I mean, Eddie, if I may also, uh, the most straight answer would be uh, no artist should go and exhibit somewhere that is asked to pay in order to exhibit. Uh, to me, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, it seems that it's, it's mostly artists that, you know, they are still living their isolated little world about, you know, promoting their own little art or becoming great art. But I mean, for Christ's sake, I mean, there's all this stuff going around and all you care about as an artist, not you, of course, you know. Uh, is to just show your work and, and, and make a name of yourself or sell, then, yeah, you might as well be paid to, to show someone. But if you're somebody who cares what's going around you, you have to find other avenues, other groups, other uh, situations. I mean, if I were an artist, I wouldn't go anywhere that they would ask me to pay to exhibit. You know, unless I'm that bad, you know, so maybe, yeah, maybe I have to pay to be shown. Yes, I mean. and, uh, the local artists will be giving you our checking account later, so you can <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The system is But I think it's also not that easy anymore uh, because here, of course, I have to consider the context. I mean, I, I presented my work in Latin America or in Asia, and usually you're not being paid at all, but still you want to make your work available there, right? I mean, in, in Europe, of course, uh, I, I try to fight for a certain fee when I present my work, and sometimes it's possible, and sometimes it's not, and then you negotiate, and then you, at some point you have to make a decision if you make your work available or not. But of course, you uh, don't want to undermine the fight for an uh, income of related to presenting work, but on the set, can, uh, but on the same level, you also uh, feel there is a certain necessity to show certain works in certain locations, and then you have to balance this and, yes. and discuss what is more important for you. I think that it, it was the, 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 the other extreme scenario is not that not getting paid, but actually paying to show. I think that's what. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I also think context is important in, in what space you show work. Um, if we're talking about a commercial gallery, uh, where the main purpose is to exhibit and to sell, and to sell yeah. um, you can argue the argument both ways. You can say the gallery is going to take a commission anyway. So, yes, it, yes, what's the difference between in paying a fee to take part in an exhibition and not pay commission to the gallery? So yeah, you can now give more points. Context, I mean, I agree with Evie that no artist should really pay a fee to a gallery to ship to the work because it's kind of degrading in a way. I mean, all the way but the gallery's business, um, they have to make their expenses. Yes. They have to survive also. So if that's the context, yeah, showing in a commercial gallery your sole exhibition or get to sell, of course you're going to pay the gallery. Yeah, you, yes. you can see in different yes, um, yes, yes. perspectives. But I mean, I, I was referring to, you know, with everything that's going on around us, okay, I might be being unfair here, yeah, but I think uh, artists that just go on their own little ways about showing their work in public galleries to sell, uh, private galleries to sell, and, and, and if they don't really get involved in what's going on around, uh, to me that, that's not art worthwhile, that, that, that's it's not, not art relevant. To begin with, maybe, is it? That's not art maybe to begin with. Yes. Do they some... have the means to go in another way out? I mean, Listen, talking about some... here, you said. There's something really That's interesting possible. happening in Greece, which I think is, it would be nice to mention. First of all, we have to admit that all the museums have really big problem of having visitors. They, the visitors are going down exactly the same way the budget goes down, for some reason. This is not some reason, actually. It's a very clear thing happening. On the other hand, uh, there is another interesting thing. Artists react. Artists don't go to galleries. Galleries seem to be dying in Greece. I had a quarrel last year with a gallerist and uh, an artist as well who were, I'm going to have the exhibition, I will pay for it, said the artist. I will be paid as a curator. And the, the, the gallerist asked us actually to pay for our tickets to get to Athens. And I was like, screw you, I'm not interested in this. And the artist, it's like he's not educated on what exactly he should do for himself. But this is something artists should be, you know, uh, really fighting about. What you're talking about is kind of an extreme situation that, 
you know, the United States we've been sort of dealing with for a long time. This doesn't work. Um, you know, students come out of with an MFA, they can be eighty thousand dollars in debt if they go to certain schools. My school, which is a public school, it's only twenty thousand. That's still an awful lot of money. So they're already in debt. They're already paying to be an artist. You know, and so what's then? What's the line between paying to be an artist and paying a gallery to have your work shown? Because that's the only way you're going to get ahead and maybe pay off that debt. So the whole system, the whole neoliberalization and deregulation of economies, like forcing exactly this kind of uh, this kind of unethic, inethic, unethical behavior, really on, on all of us, right? Yeah. Um, um, I was just wondering about the consequences, really, uh, of uh, your work. I, I, I did something very small in the summer, and I was asked to uh, bring it down by uh, a, a Russian company, and, and I did. Well, actually, I changed it a little bit. I left it up uh, because we're not very uh, we're not knowledgeable when it comes to the law as artists, I think. So I was wondering whether you're open to uh, the consequences. You mean like the legal consequences? Yeah. Like, such as? I like uh, criticizing uh, or defaming, is that a word? Uh, um, a slander. Uh, yeah. yeah, one of the companies. It would be very hard, to, I think, for them to do that. Uh, maybe you have other, but uh, the Guggenheim is very upset with us, obviously. Uh, and for the one, one of the reasons they're upset is because at least in some of the actions, people put manifestos on the wall during a futurist exhibition near artworks that people had lent to the museum. And obviously, there's a lot of insurance money involved, and they want to have future lending. They don't want to scare people away. So that's a very touchy issue for them: is that kind of direct action. Uh, and then there's the question of you know their public identity. Uh, I think we can do whatever we want to the public identity. I think it'd be very hard for them. And besides, if they sort of brought legal action against us, it would only make the matter worse for them. Uh, as far as actually maybe damaging something you see, that would be a whole different problem. And, I, and so far, that hasn't happened. Yeah, I don't no, know about the tape. That no, I mean, I, I mean, the tape is really unhappy about these things that we do, right? They're not happy about it. But, but again, they're putting me into that situation. And obviously, we're all artists involved in the Libre tape. So they have to, I mean, they do call the police sometimes when we did the, when we did the wind thing. They call, but we're not breaking any law. You know, there's no law being broken. Uh, the security guards really tried to stop. This is a massive one-ton thing. You know how big these things are. The security guards went panicked when we started coming. They're trying to stop us. We all absolutely polite, all absolutely non-violent. Saying, "Please get out of the way. We are coming in. You will not stop us." You know what I mean? And in the end, they had to give up. You know, and the police come and you know, and then they stop us for a while and will they let us out and stuff. But I just say, bring it on. You know. We're in a world that is just being destroyed. You know, the point about the BP thing is it links to climate change. It links to what is art about? You know, what is creativity about? You know, it's about life. It's about, you know, expression, yeah? It's not about death. And that's what climate change is bringing to us. It's bringing death to us. Capitalism is bringing death to our societies. And we have to kind of raise our game to that level, you know? I mean, we have to, I talked earlier that we're planning stuff for the COP summit in Paris in December already because there's an idea of occupying Paris, and really kind of saying, like, enough's enough. No more dodgy deals with Obama coming in at the last minute. You know, the fossil fuel industry has got to end, you know. We have to ramp the thing up, you know, and that, to me, is the most important thing, rather than me being in the V&A or other, you know, I mean, I'm saying, I'm not saying that that's going to roll. There's a great show at the V&A at the moment called Disobedient Objects, which is, which is two great curators of people on which I'm in, which is free, loads of people are going around, it's 99 objects that, of political disobedience that have been created by, you know, grassroots designers and activists, and that's brilliant, yeah? But we do have to kind of recognise, well, we do recognise the series, I'm not saying people don't, you know, but we don't want to be victims, you know, we actually want to change things. And like, and like Rick says, if a corporation sues me, for don't bring it on. I will make it as public as possible. I will say, you're attacking artists, what kind of people are, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's happened in the past lots of times with artists, and the, and the big, big corporations have backed down, you know. Just going to help you make a big name for yourself. It's going to help you make a big name of yourself as well, you know. I'm not. I'm really not interested in that. I mean, I don't mean. No, I mean, I'm not. I'm really not. It's not. You know. Yeah, if I wanted to be famous, you know. I would get this or You know what I mean? It's, yeah. not, it's not about it. To me, it's about what you know. The avant-garde after the First World War wanted revolution, you know, and they wanted to bring it to creativity. That's what Dada and surrealism was about. It was the first punk movement. 
you know. It's not about objects in museums that we treat like luxury goods. You know, we just had Malevich's Black Square in a tape. I think he would be absolutely horrified <laughs> that a hundred years later, people are treating these things like religious relics. Actually, you were really lucky you had this chance to finally see how uh, things can actually have an effect. It's very interesting. But you know, it's more interesting because you're an artist. Know your rights. Go for it. I mean, it's fantastic. Create a problem. You should be like a little parasite in society to create. If you wanted to ask Despite the fact that I'm really tempted to ask a question about the relationship between Ernst and the banks that call us a bonus, the cycle branches in Greece. I would kindly ask to proceed with my question in Greek as a statement. Mm -hmm. So I'm making statements here. And if I can have a problem with the political economic system and the economy, it's a meme that we can use. It's for the analysis of the political economic zones. A question that is very important is that we have a lot of our economies. A question that is αναγκάσει την Ιαπωνία να χτίζει με μπετόν, να χύνει καλούπια μπετόν, τόσο ώστε να βγει πάνω από την επιφάνεια της θάλασσας για να θεωρείται ως κόμπτος. Πώς γίνεται τότε να ξεχνούμε τούτη τη σχέση, η οποία σχέση έχει κάνει την κυβέρνηση του Παπαδόπουλου να αποτρέψει με τα διάφορα τεχνάσματα την ελληνοκυπηριακή πλευρά που το να υπογράψει το ΝΕΤ και να δούμε μάλιστα ότι η σχέση που δημιουργήθηκε απλά ανάγεται στο θέμα Τουρκία-Ελλάδα. Νομίζω ότι το πιο σημαντικό θέμα που έχουμε και είναι αυτό που έκαμε και τους τριμελούς τώρα υπάρχει μια πιθανότητα γίνεται τραμελούς δεν το συγκεκριμένο. Αλλά δεν ασχολήθηκε. Παρόλο που μου άρεσε πάρα πολύ η παρουσίαση αλλά θεωρώ πολύ λάθος το ότι δεν το πιάσαμε καθόλου το θέμα αποκλειστική οικονομική ζώνη και το Ποια είναι η σχέση τη με την πραγματικότητα, όταν μάλιστα υπάρχουν αρκετά σοβαρέ ενδείξει ότι μπορεί να οδηγήσει σε άλλε καταστάσει, αφού είναι τόσο σημαντικό για χώρε όπω την Γαλλία που αναγκάζει να το βάλουμε στα αυτονομίσματα. Και έχει τη δεύτερη μεγαλύτερη στον κόσμο. Και η Ευρώπη έχει την πρώτη, όπω είναι. Andrea, that's for you to translate, mostly, and uh, I, 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 give, I give up translation after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you, if, you can, if you can answer in English, I think everybody will be feeling. Let me try to translate, if I'm wrong, correctly. Uh, the question was kind of generally directed, and then it came to me. The question was probably one of the most significant things in our book. Oh, sorry. So, the most significant thing in our world today, or one of the most significant thing, is the division of the world into this exclusive economic zone, especially of the sea around each country. And uh, after uh, several examples from Japan to France, we came back to Cyprus, and I think the question was, how come we didn't talk? or I should I do right? <laughs> about this thing. Uh, well, I have 20 minutes to end it. <laughs> so I, I try to touch on it by referring to the explorations of 2011. Uh, okay, look at this. I mean, we are tied to geography. L let me continue from there. And geography, is the sea around us, and suddenly they are cutting the sea into small plots of land. Every state has its own plot of land. We are a border, so we are the scandal of it. Nobody knows, I mean, where is our border? Where is Turkey's border? Where is Syria's border, etc. Um, in itself, somebody may say that this is the subject of our postmodern history in this from the beginning of 2000, okay? In other words, it was there. It true indeed Babadopoulos used the argument. It's not clear how many people really focused on that. There were many other things for the no of true for rather than the exclusive economy tone, but it was an argument. But it's clear that the Greek Cypriot elite started focusing on this thing. And 
if we see it in historical terms, it was a practical move. In other words, the economy would be shifting from an economy relying on tourism and the bank to something which is akin to what the minerals or the mines were in the middle of the 20th century. The problem is, or the blessing is, the, this is the careful blessing to know, we cannot solve it alone. Once you discover that we have natural gas, we are tied to the Turkey Cypriot, whether people like it or don't like it. In other words, the Greek Cypriot cannot simply take the sea and run away. I mean, it's there. And it happens to be there, and there is no way that they can get away from it, and this is good. Now, the problem is how do you solve this thing, right? No answer. But uh, I rely on the wisdom of the board. In other words, I think we made we meaning Cypriots in general. A significant move in very difficult times in poor winner. The fact that the banking crisis exploded in that time, had to do with the bank. Somebody may say some in Europe used the banking crisis to blackmail local society in terms of natural gas. Here, people who have power do this thing, if you are asking me. Nothing surprising. The question is, Cyprus is kind of this place where it's in the middle, therefore, whether we like it or not, we will be forced to play a game global. In other words, we cannot play anything unless we take into consideration the world around us, which is liberating. Remember, in our modernization after 74, we became akin to this fantasy that we are somewhere slightly east of London or slightly south of Paris. I mean, we are next to Beirut. <laughs> we have to understand this thing. So this our business is, is reminding us. We are next to these people. That's why I started, if you remember, with this ironic comment about Egypt. We need an Egypt always. <laughs> if you go to ancient times, Egypt is always a standard ally of Cyprus, whether it was the ancient king of Agora or whatever, Magarios or whatever it is now. So, back to Joga. I think it's liberating. Maybe it's hardcore realism, or maybe we will proceed with the punk of this thing. Um, so, but I think it's the first time we, that we started to search for alliances instead of mothers. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> the age of adulthood is coming. <laughs> maybe, you never know. I mean, you can't remain a child longer, right? <laughs> But uh, there is a reality, uh, we are like ourselves, the Egypt or Israel or uh, the Syria, that finally we remember that those countries exist next to us after decades of, of denial. Or well, are we just really align ourselves to the big Western corporations? I mean, I, I might be one of the few people who wish there would be no, not enough gas and petrol around us so they can go away of this completely no, destroying <laughs> the environment, essentially. But I mean, uh, who, are we, who are we kidding? I mean, the big money out of this is going to go to this companies, and, and, and maybe a small elite of Cyprus will get some of that too, that they always do, and I don't see any, any benefit to the economy. Maybe the electricity will come a little bit cheap. Come on, but I mean, Africa is the richest country in resources on the planet, and it has the poorest people on the planet. Why? All the Western companies are there, sucking down. I mean, why do we think it's going to be different with us? And all of a sudden, you know, ah, yeah, we've got a big, rich, and powerful. You know, to to yeah. I mean, well, our I, experience. I really don't see it like that. No, our experience locally from the 1920s showed that after we have this jumbo fund money laundering, where the people dealing with money, then society reacts back and reaffirms that whatever is the collective wealth has to be dealt with collectively. In other words, of course, you were, you were a hierarchical society class wise. But after 1920, there was a consistent effort from all sides to maintain this class structure from expanding and becoming polarized, right? After 74, we had a more interest. Actually, if you look at both communities, what they actually did, they created this kind of Keynesian, social democratic, protective state for each one. So, if you have a lot of money in that structure, of course it cannot go only to the top or only to the foreign companies who are going to do the trading or whatever. In that structure, a large part of the money will go to local society. But unless, yes. sorry, unless you change the local structure. Unless you say, for example, that 
somehow the natural gas should be left out of public finances or natural, for example, this whole debate whether they should privatize, for example, the force in profit governance. It's an allegory for natural gas, okay? We have these institutions which, mind you, remember which ones they are, okay? Ports, which have to do with the sea. Yeah. Electricity, which is what the natural gas will produce. And the, uh, the, the communication, which is the new medium of the age. So what do some people want? They want to sell out the, uh, the forms of the collectivity, secret collectivity, not the great secret collectivity, okay? Uses in order to either gain some profit or control itself. If you don't control the money, if you don't control the electricity, if you don't control telecommunications, hey, you might as well reapply to become colony. <laughs> yes, but, but, but I think we are colonized now because you, you, you forgot the names of the major players that didn't exist in the other examples, the early ones, and they are called Noble, Eddy, Total. I mean, come on, yeah. we are being colonized by them. No. And I hope I'm wrong, no. but I think I, we are. I, I, I disagree with that. We are, we are not colonized by them.